Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us to come together underneath this roof. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that's here with us. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to your word tonight. Hide me behind your cross. Father, you know there's no wisdom and knowledge in me. I'm depending fully on your spirit, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. And I cannot believe just how blessed my wife and I are just to be here. I mean, because they're like singers in the house. Like there's a whole choir in here. And then they're like preachers in the house. Like so many preachers. Everyone that comes up here grabs the mic is a preacher. I'm like, man, what business do I have over here? <laughs> Praise the Lord. And uh, it's, it's growing every night and um, it's, it's awesome. We've been going through what it means to encounter God. Tonight, I'm going to be talking to you guys about encountering the struggle. Now, sometimes you kind of pull back from preaching certain sermons because you don't know how it's going to be received. And other times you just got to submit to what the Holy Spirit tells you to do and you just got to go. Uh, this is one of those sermons. And it's important because I understand that there's something that God knows about us. There's something that God knows about us. In the book of Job, you see a man that struggled. He struggled through so many things in his life. And the story of Job is really captured in just two chapters. Chapter 1 and 2. The rest of the 40 chapters is a dialogue between his friends. And I did a study on it one time, and, I'm, and I encourage you, if you ever want to do a morning devotion, do your morning devotion on the book of Job. And try and summarize each and every one of the sermons and words that were preached by Job's friends. And I challenge you to try and find a single flaw in what they had to say. And still God said, I don't know those guys. Do you hear what I said? Job, on the other hand, not only did he struggle in his relationship with God, he ended up clenching his fist to the heavens and he started questioning God. He was questioning the struggle. He cursed the day that he was born. And in the end, God came through and said, Job, I know. What is it about God that we've missed here? And you soon realize that in the struggle, you grow in your relationship with God in the struggle. So it's not necessarily what you know about God. It's what God knows about you. I mean, there are those that Jesus spoke about in the gospel of Mark chapter 7 where he says, many will work wonders in my name. Many will do great works in my name, but I will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Not you never knew him. Huh? Man, I love reading bios. I love reading bi biographical books, um, like biographies like Barack Obama. I read his one and uh, I just love reading on people like Nelson Mandela. I love reading on historical people. But let me tell you something. I could convince each and every one of you that I know where Barack Obama was educated in Hawaii, when he was born, the time that we, when, he witched, when he went to Indonesia, and um, the time when he came into America. I could convince you that I know him. Yeah. The challenge is when he walks through that door, does he know me? Yeah. You can read your word daily. You can study your word daily. You can memorize text daily. But that doesn't necessarily mean that God knows you. It's in the struggle that Job wrestled with God that he came through the other end and understood this is a man that I know in the struggle. I want you to keep that at the back of your mind as we are going to talk tonight about encountering the struggle. And is it okay if I'll be real with you today? Okay, I'm, I'm amongst my people. 
There's something in a name. When God names something, there's a meaning behind it. I know that for a fact because my parents in the islands where I come from in Samoa, when they give you a name, there's a meaning behind it. And usually islanders would name their children after important people in the family in the hope that those children will turn out like them. You know, my, my, I had a son that was, you know, my, my son, he's named after my, my dad's brother. And every time my, my son gives up on something, my dad would say, ah, I should have changed his name. <laughs> you know, God gives a name and there's a reason for the name. And an interesting character in the, in the book, of, in, in, in the Bible was a person whose name was Struggle. His name was Struggle. And not only did God give the name to this individual, he also gave the name to his people. And it was one who struggles with God and man. But the last part of his name is, he shall succeed. He shall overcome. But his name is Struggler or Wrestler, if you like. But it's interesting because he's a twin. And when he was born, both his mother, uh, both him and his brother were wrestling in the womb. And the Lord says to his mother, behold, two nations are struggling in your womb. So if you read the story of this family, it's a story about the struggle. Because Rebecca, she was struggling in the beginning to have children. And when she was finally able to have children, she has twins. And the Lord says, I'm going to bless the younger one. He actually prophesied to both parents, the younger one and the older one. The older one will serve the younger. Remember that. So Rebecca, who favored the younger one, knew that God would bless the younger and I have to also tell you, that's going against the tradition. It's going against tradition. Isaac, on the other hand, who's very traditional, who wants things done the right way. And even though Isaac knew that God had ordained the younger one and the old one to serve the younger one, he still went ahead to, att- he still attempted to bless the older one. The Bible tells us that when he realized that he had blessed the wrong one, that he, sh- he, he, he shook in fear. And the SDA commentary says that that shook in fear was really when he kind of like tapped out of his struggle with God. He was struggling with God the whole time for why have you chosen the younger one to serve the old, when it should be the older one to receive the blessing. It was really then, because the other background to that story is, The blessing can also be reversed. But when he shook in fear, he remembered God had chosen the older one. And not only that, God had reminded him. My way will always go through, no matter what. My way will always go through. Rebecca, on the other hand, was struggling with timing. She knew the younger one would be blessed. But when she saw the older one about to receive the blessing, she decided to take what was hers by a blessing and to take it through deception. And as a result, the younger brother, whose name was Jacob, takes off and never got to see his blessing, never hung around for it. He had to run away to his uncle's place. And his name was interesting too. You see, both both boys, you know, you got Esau, whose name, you know, hairy, red hair. And then you got Jacob, whose name was Deceiver. So, you know, you got to be careful what you name your kids. You know, they might end up becoming what you call them. You also got to be careful what you call your kids. But his struggle really didn't come to an end until he had an encounter with God. Now, in Genesis chapter 32, I want you to go there with me. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. And Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. 
And verse 22 says, And he arose that night, and he took his two wives, his two female servants, his eleven sons, and crossed over the fort of Jabok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man, capital M, wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against them, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Okay. He gets given a new name and it's it's a common theme. You see that in the scriptures often. God giving a new name. And with a new name comes something empowering. God is giving Jacob a new name and he says, Your name shall be one who struggles with God and man but shall prevail. What does God know about us? What does he know about us? And then his people will be called strugglers. What does he know about his people? Not only that, you see those who belong to Abraham, you see this in Galatians 3.29, those who are of Jesus Christ belong to Abraham and are heirs. So so in fact, we, we also are spiritual Israel. So we still have the name intact. As we struggle. I went to college one time in in my first year. And everybody was involved in some kind of sport. Some were involved in basketball. Others were involved in golf and rugby. You know, for me, I purposed in my heart that I would never play a team sport. Because I'm telling you, I don't play for fun. (laughs) I don't play for fun. When I'm playing rugby, I've got one thing on my mind. Murder the opposition. So I said, you know, when I give my life to God, I want to have a clean heart. Oh no, I'm not going to play rugby because rugby may be all good for the other brothers who like to play for fun. But but my God, I'm telling you, rugby is sin for me. I mean, I can't even play the last card with my kids because then I lie, I cheat, then I steal. I decided, you know, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to train and I'll do that for, for, for a workout. And it's, it's really part of your, you know, um, the, the criteria of going into ministry. You have to do some form of exercise. You know, so I decided, you know, I'm going to go to the gym. So I decided I wanted to go to the gym in a time where, because I hadn't been training in a long time, man. And, and trust me, if you haven't trained in a long time, you want to go to the gym when it's dead. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You go when it's dead. And early hours of the morning is when I used to go. So I'll turn up there and I'll train them. And I said to myself, you know what? Once I get my body back to where it used to be, then I'll go when it's packed. <laughs> but right now it's not where it's supposed to be. So I'll go when it's, when it's dead. So I went to the gym one time and, you know, I was like training in the gym. And I met a guy that was in the gym. And I'm telling you, he was like deadlifting 220 kilos for reps. And he was over 70 years old. Man, I started following him around because I wanted him to train me. Because I found out that, you know, he's like six-time national champion. And I wanted him to train me, but the guy is so grumpy, he doesn't like training anybody. But I had to try and convince this guy that I had the goods. Because I found out that he doesn't, he doesn't just train anybody. You know, he has to see whether you have potential, then he'll take you. And from what he's seen of me in the gym, he wasn't too impressed. So I remember telling him, listen, let me, let me try and I'll do my best. And he told me, okay, turn up on Monday and I want you to be here at 6.30 at night and you better be here on time. So I turned up and, because during that time when I was trying to sell myself to him, you know what I told him? I could, I could squat 800 and, 880 kilos for 10 reps. And he says, really? I said, yeah. And he's probably heard it all before. I said, I can squat... 180 kilos for 10 reps. He says, I'll see you on Monday, 6.30. You best be there. So I turned up at 10, uh, sorry, at 6.30 at the gym and I was pumped. I'd psyched myself up, 
leading up to that point, when I walked in the gym, I dropped my bag and got myself set, saw the bar, got underneath it, warmed up with 60 kilos. Then I warmed up again with a with 140, uh, with 100, and then 140. And then as soon as 180 was on, I said, all right, let's get it on. 10 reps. So I got underneath it, squatted one, two, three. And when, when I got to three, I was like, man, this is like paper, man. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it there. I get to like six. I felt my legs. And then I got to seven and I started struggling. But when I got to seven, I was like, it's all good because like I've only got three more reps to go. I can, I can get there. And just when I went down for the eighth one, I got up and I heard one. <laughs> well, I looked around and I said, hold up. I don't know where you were looking. Or how you were distracted. But that's seven going on eight. And he says, one, hurry up. <laughs> so now I racked that thing and I turned around and I was so angry with him. And I said, that was seven going on eight. And he said to me, young man, there's something you got to know. You do not count the reps that you are comfortable with. Yeah, count the reps that you struggle with because it's in the reps that you struggle with that you grow physically and ultimately you grow mentally. There was something about the struggle that I learned that day. Something about the struggle that I learned that day. God's people grow in the struggle. God's people grow in the struggle. The more times that the, the enemy throws out, the closer they were getting to where God needed them to be. Now, in Romans chapter 7, when Paul writes that, he's modeling it after you know, the, the exodus making their way over to the Holy Lands. It's those who are leaving one place to try and get to the other side. And he realizes that when God's people came out of Egypt, they began to struggle from the moment they left. But the struggle begins to pick up faster as they get closer. There used to be a game that we used to play when we were kids. Me and my, my siblings. We used to hide objects in the, in, in the room while one person is outside. And when that person gets in, they have to go looking for it. And we'll say, cold. Cold. And then as soon as they get close to where we've hit it, it's like, hot, hot, hot. Hot, 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 and then they knew. Like, when you walk with God and it starts to get hot, hot, and the struggle gets hotter and hotter and hotter, you're closer to where God wants you to be. Because the closer you get there, the more the enemy of souls comes after you, throwing everything he has in order to prevent you to get to where you need to be. But hear me tell you something about the gym. People look at pain as an indication it's the last rep. The moment they feel pain, it's the last one. My coach told me, you don't count those ones. It's in pain zone that you continue to count as many reps as you can get because it's in pain zone that you grow. Do you know how much God loves us, right? He calls us gold and silver. Gold and silver. He said to Zechariah, my people are likened to gold and silver. Now, I thought to myself, why? Because even in Malachi chapter 3, verse 3, he says, I'm the refiner of gold and silver. Now, gold and silver has to be tried. It has to be. They have to go through the fire. Now, when they go through the fire, somewhere I read that the fire adds value. The fire adds value to the metal. So as we're going through the fire, God is also seeing the integrity of our metal as we're going through it. So he continuously affirms his people, your gold and silver. Let me tell you something. You may go out of shape, but you'll never lose value as you're going through the fire. You've got to go through it because everything that is gold and silver must be tried. Now, one of the saddest verses that you find is when Ezekiel rebukes God's people. 
God says to Ezekiel, go and tell my people that they have become like copper and tin to me. I worked at Mithman's Tap Makers. We used to shine up copper and we used to shine up tin. And man, we used to shine them things up and used to make rings out of them and sell those rings because they gave the illusion when you sign up copper real good, it looks like gold. And when you sign up tin, it looks like silver. God says, go tell my people that they have become to me like tin and copper. When they pass through the fire, they disintegrate. They disintegrate. We're going to go through many trials and tribulations. Now let me tell you something. Paul under... Paul understood something about the struggle. He penned it down in Romans chapter 7. Now I want you to look with me at Romans chapter 7. He knew something about the struggle. Romans chapter 7. You're going to have to stay with me closely. Because we're going deep. Romans chapter 7. Look at verse 1. Romans chapter 7. Or do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know. Who know the what? Okay. That whole chapter, is it talking about the non-believer? Who's it talking about? It's talking about the one that knows the law. In other words, it's talking about the Israelite and the Christian. Both who know the law. Paul goes on to say, it's like, a light being switched on and all of a sudden you know you've been enlightened God's people who know the law the moment that the Lord reveals to them his commandments, his will the struggle begins now take for example the person who has never understood God's expectations and God's laws who's out there in the world doing everything and anything. He's in the dark. He doesn't have an understanding of what he's doing. When I was in the world, I was doing a lot of things I thought was okay because it was okay for me. When I came to an understanding of God's will for my life, I went, oh man. Now, I wish I didn't know that. I wish I didn't know that because the word is speaking to me. It makes sense to me. And I, in my mind, I'm like, it makes sense. It is right. I should do it. But then Paul says, there's a problem. I lack the willpower to do it. My mind knows what I should do. But because I'm in the flesh, I'm in the flesh. So sin is not just an action. It's a state of being. In the same way, Righteousness is not right doing. It's a state of being. You know, in the world today, when somebody steals, he's a thief. He's a thief because he acted. According to Paul, he was already a thief. That's why he stole. You don't do and then become you are. That's why you do. So now Paul is like, now the struggle is real. Because there are certain things that my flesh loves to do. But the Lord has revealed to me what I ought to do. And now the thing that I know I should do, I can't do. Because when I look to myself, how can I produce it? I mean, you're trying to get a factory that produces Adidas to all of a sudden produce Reeboks. And there's just no way you can do it. So a scholar by the name of D.G. Dunn says, there are three phases to the struggle. Actually, there's four. But for us, three. I'll tell you why the fourth one lasts. The first phase of the struggle is that phase where you're in the unknown. You're committing sin. You're committing adultery. You're stealing. You're deceiving. But you don't know better. 
So for you, the struggle is there, but you ain't involved in the struggle. You are comfortable with the struggle because it's your nature and you're doing what you do. When the second phase of the struggle is when the light goes on and God reveals to you what you shouldn't do. So most people who come into Christianity or give their life to God will leave platform one and get to platform two. And this is where they begin to go to war. They're at war because they say, hey, if only I was there where I didn't know. But I'm here, I know now. So now I'm going to wrestle with this. And he begins to wrestle daily. Daily. Day in and day out, he'll be wrestling with those things. He'll be, he'll be trying to give it up to the point where he'll realize, and this is inevitable, that he can't overcome it. You can't overcome it. You look into your own wisdom. You look into your own strength to try and overcome this. This is why when people come to you and say, you know, I'll turn up to your church gathering, but let me get over the drinking first and the smoking first and the drugs first. When I've done that, then I'll come. I guarantee you, they'll never come if that's what they're hoping for first. Christ says you've got to come as you are. You've got to come as you are. Because there's something that Jesus knows about you and I. So here it is. They're at platform two. They'll either get to the next platform or they'll go back. Because you know what happened is, they'll try and fight it. They'll try and overcome it. And when they don't overcome it and lose hope, they do the moonwalk back to here. Right? They go back here and then they become comfortable with it. Let me tell you something. It is far better to struggle with your weaknesses than to become comfortable with it. Huh? It is far better to struggle with your weaknesses than to become comfortable with it. And comfortability is right here at platform one. It is death zone. Now I'm telling you, far better for the Christian and the Israelite that's here, that, well, far better for the, for, the, for the person that is on platform one that has no understanding. Has no understanding. While they're at platform two, you're wrestling. And some of us are right here. Some of your friends, your neighbors, they're here. But some of us sitting in church today, we're right here. We're struggling with pornography. We're struggling with stealing. We're struggling with adultery. We're struggling with lying. We're struggling with being faithful. We're right here and we're fighting it. We're saying, I want to be faithful. I want to be honest. I want to give up pornography and alcohol. I want to give it up. So you either go that way or you get to platform three. And platform three is recognizing and realizing that the fight is not yours, it's God's. Now the Holy Spirit be working on your heart while you're here to get it to three because you have to realize that the battle is not yours. Romans chapter 7, he goes on to say, as he's wrestling with himself, Paul says, who will rescue me from this body? Because I'm telling you, I want to do the right thing, but this body is craving the things which it knows and loves. So God says, there's going to be a war with your spirit and the flesh. So right here at platform three is where we all need to get as Christians, as believers. It doesn't mean struggle over though. It means the battle is God's. It means I want to surrender what I'm going through to God. Platform four is end of the struggle. And the end of the struggle is the second coming of Jesus. Who will rescue me from this body? Christ. When does the body transform? The second coming. You'll no longer be the body. So here's four. That's the hope. So many of us are like, well, one, we're hoping for the second coming so that, you know, Jesus can bring about the end of the world. I'm telling you, the real reason we ought to be asking God for the second coming is for the end of the struggle. 
It's for the struggle to finally come to an end. The one thing I used to talk to my sister about, every time I talked to her on the phone, I said, man, we're going through the struggle again. She's like, yeah, we're struggling too. But we used to try and comfort each other by saying, the struggle will soon come to an end. Struggle will soon come to an end. My sister was up here for praise and worship, said something. And you know what? Every person that said something every night, it's always connected to the sermon. She said, you know, even if I don't get to see the end of the storm, do you want to know how biblical that is? You are two characters in the Bible, one Elijah, the other Elisha. Huh? Now, Elijah hands, hands his coat over to Elisha. Elisha asked for something crazy. He says, I want a double portion of the spirit. Now, you don't know how crazy that is. Because Elijah turns around and says, Elisha, that's a hard thing you've asked for. Now, you're thinking, why would he say such a thing? Why would he say it's a hard thing? Is it hard for Elijah to give him a double portion? It shouldn't be because it's not his. Is it hard for God? It shouldn't be because nothing is too hard for God. So that leaves only one option. It's hard for who? Hard for Elisha. He's asked for a double portion of the Holy Spirit. Some of us are struggling with one. Now the brother is not just asking for a portion of the Holy Spirit. He says, give me a double. And you know the old saying, you've got to be careful what you ask for. Elijah gets to escape the struggle with his life. Elijah comes. And if you read about Elijah's life, he struggled from the get-go right to the end. He never got to see the end of the storm. He never got to see the end of the storm. Spirit of prophecy says that his, these two men represent God's people. Some will get through the struggle. Others won't. But it's not about the struggle. It's about who we glorify through the struggle. Who we reveal through the struggle. And on top of that, the SDA commentary says that God can only trust certain people with the struggle. God's in control of all things. He either makes something happen or he allows something to happen. If the struggle is knocking at your door, either God sent it there or he allowed it to get there. But he knows something about you. It's what he knows about you. And Elijah and Elisha both have become inspirational in the fact that one held on and got through. The other didn't. And there's hope that we can draw from both. That while we're going through the struggle, there's hope that we might get through. And there's hope that even if we don't get through, God is glorified. You've got Moses, his son, you've got Abraham and his son Isaac. Abraham, when he experienced a famine, escaped to Egypt, got out of the struggle. Isaac experienced the famine as well. And God says, stay where you are. But you allowed my father to go. I know. You, you stay. Some of us, God will rescue from the struggle. Others, God will say, stay put. You got to get through it because there's something that God knows about you and I as we're going through the struggle. So have a, have a look with me at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Stay with me now. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. When you're there, let me say amen. amen. Okay. Okay. Look at verse 7. At least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. Least I be exalted above measure. Concurring this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Let me tell you something. 
When you're struggling with something, pray. The reason I say that is because many of us, when we're struggling with something, feel unworthy to pray. Many of us, when we're wrestling with something, like you've just done something wrong, all of a sudden you hear the voice of the devil saying, what, you think God's going to hear you now? After what you did? You're absolutely right, he's going to hear you out. You've got to call upon God the moment you feel the struggle kick in. And you've got to learn to live by that prayer. You got to pray about it every day. Paul is saying, I pray three times a day. Every day he's praying that the thorn will be taken out. Now, so many scholars are arguing, what was it that Paul was struggling with? We don't need to know. Not everybody needs to know what we're struggling with. Not everybody needs to know what you're struggling with. Because let me tell you something. It becomes an extra burden to you. It's an extra burden to you. Even those who you think you trust, don't even let them know about what you're going through. Because your relationship is not always going to be smooth. You're going to go through some ups and downs. And during the ups and downs, they're going to be talking about what you're struggling with. And then when your relationship is healed, they're going to say they're sorry, but the word is out. And it might just be the word that pulls the plug on your faith for good. Your struggle, now I'm talking to you, like if you're, if you're a married couple here, you're one. You're one. So your struggle is between the both of you. If you're single, you're married to God. It's between you two. Right? Your girlfriend is not your wife. Huh? And your best friend is not your man lover. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you've got to be able to protect one another. Even if you're sitting there and someone comes into the door and says, I heard something about out of arrow. The first thing you have to say is, I don't want to know about it because I can't do nothing about it. You want to talk to someone, talk to God or go to arrow. I guarantee you that won't go to arrow. I'm telling you, the devil is spending his days and nights awake waiting for God's people to give him a little gap in the window and he just needs a gap he just needs a gap that's why when you're going through something don't entertain the idea give it to God don't play around with it I'm telling you right now anybody that says they're on top of their game when it comes to sin is a fool Only one can conquer sin. That's Jesus Christ himself. None of us can be able to overcome this thing without him. So you've got... You've got that place when you're in platform one. The Holy Spirit is working with you. Trust me when I tell you. The Holy Spirit is working with a lot of people that's out in the world today that you think are not (laughs) working. I heard somebody say one time, if only they had the Holy Spirit... That's a lie. That's a lie. I'm telling you right now, that person in the world will have no hope of coming to Platform 2 without the Holy Spirit. So when you bring someone to Platform 2, don't try and high-five nobody like you brought them to Platform 2. Don't try and glory. Paul is saying, I I shouldn't shouldn't rise above this thing. I'm going to keep it here. The Holy Spirit is working with them. Now the Holy Spirit at phase one is working with the individual from the outside in. Once the individual gives his life to God, the Holy Spirit works on the inside out. But make no mistake, the Holy Spirit is at work. And only the Holy Spirit can get glory for the work that's happening. Now the Holy Spirit's got to get you to the next platform, which is recognize that the battle is not yours. The battle belongs to God. So when the battle belongs to God, you're on your knees every day talking to him about where you are right now. If your love is this phileo, let him know it. If you ain't up to it, talk to God. Open yourself up to him. Surrender yourself to him every day because you know what's happening. 
while you're surrendering yourself to God, while you're in the Word, still and weak in the flesh, but you're dependent, someone who's truly weak will continuously be training. How do they train? They're training by being in the Word, submission to God, listening to things that, that, that talks life. So they're continuously surrounded by God, by everything that they do, the people that they have around them. When you're, when you're here at phase two and you're, you're continuously surrounding yourself with people, with music and things that's going to corrupt your walk, it's going to be difficult for you to recognize that the battle was God's. You may recognize it, but you haven't yet given it over to him. You haven't yet surrendered it. You got some people that, like, Lord, I ask for forgiveness, but deep down inside, there's something that's still there that they don't want to really give up. Yeah. There's something that's there that, that's still sweet to them. Truly surrendering yourself is coming to that point where you're saying to God, here I am, take it. But here's the issue. I'm battling every day and I don't know whether I'm going to get through this. So here's what Paul says. Going back to our text, he says in verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Here's God's answer in verse 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in where? In weakness. So let me tell you something. A person that has come to platform 3 and has realized that the battle is God, continuously comes to God. And the more they come to God, the more God's power is manifested in the person. Do you know, if you read the scriptures in the Old Testament, I'll give you another example. Gideon raised an army of 32,000 to take on an army that was without number. And God says, you got to bring that number right down. And he brought the number right down to 300. So that the smaller they are, and they're victorious, the more glory goes to God. you got to bring it right down. But the bigger they are, the more it seems as if they did it themselves. So in the same way, when we're at war and we're struggling with something, God is pleading with us that we will come so low as to, weak, as to admit that we're weak, as to admit that we know nothing. We're coming before him. And the less there is of us, the more there is for God to, pre, to, to reveal to the world. Let's go to the last part. He says, therefore, most I... Sh- most I glad, most therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in what? Infirmities. And in what? In reproaches. And in what? In needs. And in what? In persecutions. And in what? In distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Man, you didn't get that, did you? Yeah. Kind of like a paradox, isn't it? Because yeah. you realize that in the world, you know, we kind of see that as being weak. Because you're in the world. But you're so full of yourself in this stage, right? You know, you're here. God wants to bring you right down to a point where he's, he's broken you down so that God can begin to work in you. Everybody is going to be struggling with something. We're going to be struggling with something daily. So we're going to be in the word daily. Christ himself struggled as well. He struggled himself. Where? He had that last meal with his friends. He realizes that the end is about to come. He's about to leave. So there was a cup that he gave to his disciples. Now the cup that he gave was a cup that they did not deserve. That cup was the cup of life that he gave to his disciples. There's a cup that they deserve, but that cup Jesus is about to take when he makes his way into the garden. So as soon as he makes his way to the garden, Jesus takes his closest three. And as his closest three, 
walk with Jesus into the garden. Jesus begins to wrestle in the garden. What's he wrestling with? Jesus is wrestling with this cup. That cup is the cup of eternal separation. Jesus, who's been one with the Father from eternity, has never been separated from the Father ever. Now sees a cup, and that cup represents reconciliation. The reconciliation of heaven and earth, God and man. And only one person can take on that mission. Jesus, realizing it's him that needs to take this mission on our behalf, looks at the cup, and he says, Father, take this cup away from me. Yeah. I'm looking at Paul, and he's like, I, I want... I want to get out of the flesh. Who can rescue me from this flesh? For as long as that flesh is with him, he's going to be struggling daily. But Paul knows that if I recognize it's God's and I continue to go to God with this thing, there's hope. The hope is Jesus is in the garden. He's got this cup. And he says, take this cup away. But if it is your will, Jesus takes the cup and drinks it. He drinks it on our behalf. And so for the first time in the history of anything ever being created, Jesus and his father were separated for the very first time. To the point where Jesus cried out and said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabakani, father, father, why have you forsaken me? Separated at the cross. So for the very first time, you've got justice who once sat on a throne, now being dethroned, moves close to the cross. And on the other side, you've got mercy. Mercy moves towards the cross. And for the very first time in history, you've got, the, you've got justice and mercy kissing for the first time because the one who was lifted up was worthy. Jesus overcomes for you and I. Jesus overcomes the enemy, overcomes the struggle, because for you and I, let me finish with this. There's been many things that both my wife and I, my family, we're wrestling with, fighting with. But you know the one thing we knew? God's at war. He's at war for you and I. And he wants nothing more than for us to be there. He's fighting on our behalf. And he realizes we gotta give, we're going to be going through some things, each and every one of us. Some of us are sitting here today feeling unworthy to be, to be before God because we're wrestling with things. Paul was wrestling with things. Peter wrestled with things. David wrestled with things. Jonah wrestled with things. We're all wrestling with things. But it's realizing that the battle belongs to God and calling upon His name daily. Asking that the Lord will help you. Even now. I told you guys yesterday when a lot of guys used to say they got through the struggle and went to college. I was not sure whether that's true or not. Because for me, I'm going through the struggle while I'm going to college. While I'm preaching His Word. And sometimes I'm saying, God, get somebody else. One time I said to myself, I'm, I'm going to resign from ministry and pull away because I'm still wrestling with so many things in my personal life. Wrestling with forgiveness. You know, just wrestling, with, wrestling with, with murder in your mind. There's so many things that are going on within your own life. And you, and you say to yourself, I want to resign from ministry and walk away. I said, Lord, I'm done. The very next day, you get an invitation to come speak somewhere. <laughs> then you're there while you're preaching. You realize that the sermon that you're preaching, hoping that will find somebody, is actually that somebody is you. Yes. Yes. 
you're at home and you're like, you know, Lord, I'm about to give up on this thing and walk away from Christianity for good. Sister, can you come and do special item? You get up to sing that special item. Nobody knows what you're going through. And you begin to sing. And when you're singing, you realize after the first verse, that song ain't for people out here. That song's for me. You realize I'm not going back to church no more. I don't want to be that elder anymore. I don't want to be that person that ushers everybody in. And then all of a sudden you turn up the church. Somebody comes up to you and says, Oh, God bless you. It's so good to see you. And then you realize, Oh, man, I was meant to be here. While you're going through your struggles, never give up on hope that God got you. And never let the devil fool you into thinking that just because you feel the pain, it's an indication for you to pull out. The pain is an indication that you're right where you're supposed to be. Continue to keep moving forward, not allowing the devil to throw you down. Because once you understand that there's victory in the struggle, that there's strength in weaknesses, only then will you come to a place where you will be glorying in your infirmities. You'll be glorying in opposition. You'll be praising God in your downfalls. You'll be singing praises while you're weak because only when you're weak will you realize that God is strong.